You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Tori Chrisman joined the Church of Scientology in 1969 and escaped out in 2000. She is one of Scientology's most beloved and outspoken critics, and she has her own YouTube channel where she exposes the church's doctrine and abuses called Tori Magoo 44. She has made, at the time of this recording, 943 videos that have earned her 4.6 million views. Welcome, Tori Christmas. Sure. So what is Scientology? How would you define it? It's supposedly a religion. I would say it is a mind control, soul sucking, fraudulent business pretending to be a religion. That's very close to what Mark Hebner said. And how is Scientology different than, say, Christianity or Catholicism? Well, I was raised as a Catholic. And as a Catholic, you have faith, you have belief. And Scientology is now trying to plug in those words and say that they have them. Like Tommy Davis, I think, was the first person who said, you know, you're hurting my faith. And I immediately went online and said, his faith in what? They don't believe in God. I mean, they do have God. As Hubbard had eight dynamics that you survive on. The first one is yourself. Second one is your family, you know, on up. And the eighth one is a higher power, whatever you believe that to be. That's the only mention of God, period. I know Hubbard was very interested in Crowley. I mean, couldn't that be Satan? Yeah. I guess, I mean, you know, it's like whatever you believe that to be. But my point is for a Christian, they're thinking of God for religion. They believe in God and these people or any other religion, whatever they believe in, it's usually a higher power. They don't have a higher power in Scientology. You are the higher power. It's also very strange that it's very hard when you ask a Scientologist what they believe. It's always very gobbledygooky and vague. Because they don't believe. They don't have beliefs. Hubbard started with Dianetics in 1950, and he said it is a science of the mind. That's what he said. Dianetics, modern science of mental health, which is really ironic because Hubbard was completely 100% against mental health as we know it, you know, like any kind of therapy, any kind of medicine. I have epilepsy. I take medicine for it. They insist that I get off of it. I nearly died twice because of it. Thankfully, my mother saved my life, but they're very anti most medicines. They'll let you take antibiotics and stuff like that, but most medicine they're against. Certainly any psych medicine, that's what they call it, psych medicines, which is any therapist that would give you medication. How did you get into Scientology? I read a book. You know, see, academics who study cults, and Scientology is a cult, in my opinion. And academics who study cults say, first of all, the two worst cults are the Moonies and Scientology, because they build these traps in your mind early on that you can't talk to anybody else about anything. And people listening to this will go, I would never do that. And I would never either. I was a hippie. I was a free speech advocate. So the things I say to you that I've done, I would have never done. It's very ironic and insidious in that way. Mm -hmm. My friend in high school, I was sick and I was in the hospital and my friend in high school came and gave me a Dianetics book. And I had been trying to do Buddhism and Taoism and some other higher things, I thought. And I basically wanted to become a doctor. My grandfather was a doctor, a medical doctor. And I wanted to become a doctor. So I ended up with the Dianetics book in college in my hometown in Chicago, Lake Forest, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And I didn't like it. I went to Lake Forest College. I didn't like that. And I thought, you know, I hate school. I'm never going to make it for four years in college. 
four years in medical school, internships, blah, blah, blah. And with Dianetics, you could in six weeks become a Dianetic auditor, which is a counselor. Mm -hmm. And it sounded as great as a doctor. So I thought, that's what I'm doing. And I had an argument with my dad. He said, it's our morals or no school. Go to bed at 1030. And I just wrote on my mirror, your morals or no school, screw you. And I packed (laughs) up and I hitchhiked from Chicago to L.A. to do Dianetics. And what was your impression when you first entered? Was it an org at that point? Did they have orgs? That's a good question. Because back in the day and for many, many years, they always called all of their quote-unquote now churches orgs, meaning an organization. Most people started with a mission, which was like, I would say, do you want me to come over and, you know, we'll have coffee and I, I want to show you something new. That's how the mission started. It was just kind of a get together kind of thing. But then at the back of the Dianetics book, it said for more information, go to St. Hill, England, or American St. Hill in L.A. And I knew I couldn't make it to England, so I thought, all right, I'm going to L.A. So I hitchhiked there, but that's a good question. What was your first impression? There's a book, and for anyone listening to this, I highly recommend you get it. It's called Blink, and it's about your first instincts are often, most of the time, correct. And my first instinct of Scientology was, A, it looked, these big, huge photographs of Hubbard looked like Nazi Germany. B, they were all in Navy uniforms back then. And I was a hippie protesting the Vietnam War. And I was like, wait a minute, this is like the Army or the Navy. And then C was they were super organized and I was against organizations. So I kind of, my first instinct was like, ew, I don't like it. But my friend said, just ask for this guy on the big course. So I said, I want to talk to this guy on the big course. They said, you can't. He's studying. He'll call you at 1030. So I hitchhiked out to the valley to someone's house that my friend in Chicago had said, just go to this guy's house. You can stay there for a while. So I went there. We got stoned. And I thought, yeah, sure. The guy's going to call me at 1030 right And he did. At 10.35, he called. And I was like, it's the guy. (laughs) And he said, said, hi, Tori. Okay, I'm going to come out and get you. And I'll be there in about 20 minutes. And again, we thought, yeah, sure, he's going to drive out here at 10.30 at night and get you. And sure enough, he came to the front door, got me, brought me back to the American St. Hill, which was this big organization, and all these highly trained auditors were outside of the organization at the time talking. So he bought a six-pack of beer. I thought, well, he can't be all bad. He drinks beer because they seem very, like, kind of brainwashed, like kind of like robotic, the staff did. And so I thought, well, he drinks beer. He can't be all bad. So then he let me ask him different questions, like, why do they have those big pictures? You know, why do they have to wear the uniforms? That kind of thing. And everything that I would say, say, oh, we don't we don't really care about that. That's the staff. That's the Sea Org. That's not us. We're auditors. And that's all I wanted to do was become an auditor. So basically, he said, let's go talk to the auditors. And I remember standing next to some auditors and they were talking And I remember thinking, I don't care what these people do, I want to be one of them. And that was the beginning of the shutdown of my critical thinking. That's so interesting. They said, well, that's not really, that's not really part what this is about, kind of the the creepy militarism, the other things, you know, it's so interesting. Back then it wasn't, it Mm -hmm. really wasn't. The Sea Org was, but most of the public we all agree. We had a really good time back then. It was very fun. It was very di- – we used to say, if it isn't fun, it isn't Scientology. Now, you would never say that now. Never. Not even if you were in. You wouldn't. So what made the change? Is it David Miscavige or – I think it was a combination of Hubbard was basically, I think, you know, he started in the, I think, 49, said, if you want to make money, start a religion. So he wrote Dianetics started it, I think he believed in a way that he could really help people. But obviously he wanted to make money. Now, anyone listening, Scientology is like a triangle. So you start out, they go, oh, it's hardly anything or it's free. It's $20. Come on in, do the communication course. It's nothing, right? But once you get on that mind control train, honestly, it's very hard to get off. 
It is. Because they, first of all, as soon as you get on, as soon as you join, as soon as you walk in the door, before you do, they already know your major buttons. Mm -hmm. Buttons are things that we all have that if you push them, you get upset or you have a reaction. And they find out what those are. While you're out on the street, they're talking to you. You know, like what's ruining your life? That We used to ask people that back in the 60s and 70s. And people will tell you. They'll go, well, I can't communicate or I can't make money or I have trouble with my family. So they already know this is your button. This is your problem, right? Uh-huh. So now once you get in, you do a communication course. Most people that did it said that was my biggest win was the communication course. It, it's a simple course, but it's, a pretty good course. Mm-hmm. And that's the, then, is that the cheapest course in Scientology? Yeah, well, it, now they have free things because people didn't even want to pay for that. So now they have freer things, a few little things. But as soon as you become a Scientologist, which you have to pay to become, to say you're a Scientologist now, you have to join an association that are Scientologists and that costs money. Mm-hmm. Now, they know your button, so they just keep coming back to it and saying, you know, I know that you had wins on the communication course, but you didn't really fix you needing money, let's say. So the next course will really help you with that. And they also have already found out who you really respect. And if you don't go for it with the person that you're talking to, they bring in people that they know you would respect. And those people say, oh, definitely do the next course. You know, there's all these courses that you need to do, but the next one for sure will help you. Wow. So you're always looking forward. Yeah. So you got into Scientology. You wanted to help people. I mean, what is the goal of Scientology? They're always talking about like a better world. How do you think you're doing that in Scientology? Hubbard said we're going to clear planet Earth. That means you're going to get everyone up through their clearing course and they will be rid of what he called the reactive mind. Now, ironically, he said you have the analytical mind and the reactive mind. The analytical mind is like a computer just recording things. Mm -hmm. The reactive mind is where your buttons are. It's upsets, losses, pains, different things like that that you have. And he said, if you can erase the upset, the charge, he calls it charge, electrical charge, if you can erase that, then you will be clear. Now, obviously, that didn't really work out. So now they're doing all kinds of other little things like the way to happiness and Narconon and other front groups that are trying to spread out in the community, make Hubbard's name good. And then they can get them from there, jumpstart over into Scientology. So do they really think that they're going to clear the planet, like get every person? Oh, yeah. Okay. And they constantly are pitching because you have to understand, like in the United States, they've pretty much gone through it. And we're all like, yeah, we know we're not interested. You know, most people, (laughs) (laughs) or they've left. This was back 20 years ago when I would go to events. They were back then saying, well, we're in Guatemala and the police department in Guatemala is now using this study tech and everyone will cheer and stand up and clap. And and so it has this peer pressure group think that you get into and you're expected when you go, they don't say it, but you just pick it up that. That's part of your job is to help support everyone else that's supporting LRH and now David Miscavige. So the interesting thing about Scientology is they're always doing better than, you know, the month before, the year before. Right. So they they say. say. Right. But let's think about it. They now, their top course was the class 12 course. They no longer even have it. David Miscavige canceled the class 12 course and their biggest auditing course was the briefing course, and they no longer have that. So in truth, if you look in their orgs, people all the time say, well, they, they must be doing well. They have so many new buildings, and they do. But really, that's what they're into is real estate. That's what they're doing is buying buildings, and that's what you see. And they put their big Scientology sign on outside the thing. And it's like they're everywhere, Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean for real they're successful. If you go look in the buildings, most of them, everyone I've looked in is empty. 
there's hardly anybody in there, maybe three or four people. So they're buying buildings for other Scientologists to think that they're expanding? Is that the idea, or do they? Yeah, for everyone to think they're expanding. And let's face it, real estate is always a good investment. Sure. You know, they'll buy it, just like Hollywood Boulevard. They bought those buildings years ago when Hollywood Boulevard was a dump. And I remember when they bought them, and I was like, why would you buy buildings up on Hollywood Boulevard? I just couldn't even imagine it. Like, what are they thinking? Well, guess what? It's now their testing center is right less than a block from the Kodak Center, which is right on Hollywood and Highland, which is where that's Hubbard's fictional work came out of author services, which is all a money-making scheme. All of it. All of it boils down to money. Yeah. So close to a business. It's unbelievable. That's what I'm saying. You know, yeah. That's why I say it's a mind control fraudulent business. business. And it's a yeah. fraudulent business because they promise certain things and they do not deliver. And even Hubbard wrote a policy saying, look, if somebody comes in here and they buy stuff and they, they're not happy, let them go. Give them their money back. Get rid of them. Right. Yeah. That's the policy. They will not give a dime out to people. They did to me and a few people because we knew how to pound them the right way. But most people, they won't give them their money back. So I want to go back to the state of clear. That's something you achieved, right, Tori? You went clear? Not really. I have epilepsy. The original definition of clear is a perfect memory, which obviously I don't have, a perfect IQ, no somatics, and no pain. That's the original definition Hubbard had in Dianetics. That's what I read for clear. Now, obviously, no one could achieve that. So over the years, Hubbard just kept transforming clear to be like, okay, it's a perfect this and that. And, you know, they finally took away the word perfect because no one had it, right? (laughs) Right. So by the time I got up to the level of clear, I went out with Arthur Hubbard, who was L. Ron Hubbard's son, and I had lunch with him. Now, I never saw him again. I never saw him before. I don't know how it happened, but I had lunch with him. And he said, why don't you tell me your story? And I told him my story, what I've told you. I read maybe three chapters of Dianetics, realized this is what I want to do. I packed up, hitchhiked from Chicago to L.A. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, my God. Your last lifetime clear. You worked with my dad last lifetime. Wow. You know, it was so amazing. I had never heard that. Now they, you hear a bunch of people say that, but I'd never even heard those terms. And I was like, oh, and it's kind of like dominoes all set up and, oh, it's perfect. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. Because then I don't have to worry about epilepsy, right? Uh Uh-huh. It was last lifetime. Okay. And I guess all these things are promised, even though it's vague. Do you feel like you've achieved something when you get, when they say, okay, you're clear? Do you feel different just no. by the suggestion now, of it? Now, now, some people may. Remember, I never really felt like I was clear because I have epilepsy. Okay. So I never really felt clear. Arthur Hubbard said I'm clear. Okay, I must be clear. That works. And I, at this point, I didn't care. I just wanted to get, everyone kept talking about OT3. And that's what you need, Tori. That's what you need to get up to. That'll handle epilepsy. OT3 is the thing that was exposed on South Park. Right, with Zeno that most people know about. Yeah. When you got those materials, was that a big letdown? What did you think? (laughs) (laughs) Well, first of all, you have to pay for everything. Second of all, you have to be invited onto each level. So it's all a big hoopla for every little step to get to the next step on this triangle up the ladder. Mm -hmm. What you don't know is that every inch of every step up this triangle, you are losing freedoms. You're paying to get free and you are losing freedom. You are less and less free the higher up you go in Scientology. So what does that look like? I mean, you say less and less free. I mean, what does that mean? You know, it's like you can't possibly read that book. You're OT7. You know, we're expecting you to represent the Church of Scientology. What are you thinking of? Uh Okay, okay, I get it. Okay, I just thought I'd look at it, but okay, I won't. You know, that kind of thing. Uh Uh-huh. 
Well, let's watch this TV show that's, you know, Leah Remini. No, <laughs> no, it's just right. total bad news. She's a liar. We threw her out. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, they didn't throw her out. She left. Mm-hmm. She asked one simple question. Where is Shelly Miscavige? She was at Tom Cruise's wedding. Mm-hmm. And she said, where's Shelly? Because Shelly wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And she mm-hmm. knew Shelly. And the guy that she was talking to said, you don't have the authority to ask that question. Right. And that was it. She said, really? And she was out of there. She got her whole family out. She was going to write a book, do a show on it. That was it. But typical of Scientology, they pound everyone that leaves. And they made a huge website about it and just, you know, on and on and on. Until she finally went, okay, you're on. And she's done, I think, three years of series of interviewing second generation people, mostly, who've been seriously abused. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. I wasn't going to speak out. I called the person when I left and said, I'm not going to speak out. I'm not going to pick it. I'm not going to make any videos. She said, okay, Tori, we're just doing what I wish someone had done for me when I left the Sea Org. I said, okay. But... Within a week of being out, they had made so many lies about me. I finally thought, you know what? I have free speech too, and I might have something to say. Now, (laughs) I have made over 900 videos on YouTube with Tori Magoo 44. That's my name on YouTube. And that's in honor of my dad because he had little tiny eyes like I do. So I used to call him Mr. Magoo. Mm -hmm. And he was in the Football Hall of Fame. And his football number was 44. And he passed away when I, when I was 22 and he was 51. So now I wake up years later and I can't talk to anyone. So what am I going to do? And I just felt like I was talking to my dad and he just said, get out of L.A., just get out of there. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to keep this guy close to me. <laughs> <laughs> and your dad had the greatest advice about bullies. Yeah, because, you know, people get bullied all the time. And my father was a really cool guy. He was a football player. But he said, look, as long as someone will sit down at the table with you and talk to you, it's okay. You know, it's okay that they disagree. That doesn't matter. The only people that won't sit down with you and talk are bullies. And they will not ever talk. And that was one of my realizations towards the end of Scientology. I realized that's who they are. They won't talk. In in Scientology, isn't communication the universal solvent? (laughs) Yes, yes. The irony is that's one of the ironies. So just back to OT3 quickly. Did it sound crazy to you when you heard the creation story? Okay, back when I did it, like now they have a whole course on it because they they realize it's a lot to get people to believe. Mm -hmm. But back in my day, they handed me a little folder, put me in like a closet, literally. It was a little tiny room by myself and handed me this folder and said, this is OT3. And Hubbard writes, you know, back in blah, 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 this year, I was out on the ship, and I started realizing that 75 million years ago, there was this evil warlord named Xenu, X-E-N-U is how he spells it. And anyway, he went on to tell this crazy story, and I just thought, this is insane, And, you know, this can't possibly be what all these people have been telling me what it is. You know, it just was like, this is absolutely total insanity, right? Uh But then I sat back for a minute and I thought, now, wait a minute. I have epilepsy. No neurological doctors to this day know what actually causes epilepsy. They think it might be this or it might be that, but they don't really know. And so I thought, what if... This is it, that yes, you're covered with these spirits called body thetans that are from this other planet 75 million years ago, and they've swooped down and they've covered up all of our bodies, and that's what's causing our pain. So that's what got me going, well, I'll try it. And I had huge wins on it, because only because it really taught me a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. And if you believe it enough, it's true for a little bit. That's interesting. Like I really thought I was erasing epilepsy. So every session I would come out and people would go, 
oh, my God, you look so much different. And I did. I would look in the mirror and go, wow, I really do look different. I look better. I look healthier. I truly thought I was erasing it. There's a very interesting part of Scientology where you can't talk about your case with anyone else. You were married to a Scientologist. How does that affect a marriage or your friendships? I don't think you see it when you're in. I call it the Truman Show because if any of your audience has seen the movie, The Truman Show, that's exactly how Scientology is. You're at the right time, at the right place, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's Scientology. So for me, when you're in The Truman Show, you feel like you're doing the right thing. So you don't need to share with your friends or your husband because that's built in from day one. Don't talk about it. If you talk about it, you're never going to get free. If you read these books we tell you not to read, you will never get free. This is why, and Hubbard listed out all these different organizations that had fallen by the wayside in history. And he said that's because they didn't have a path. They really didn't have a strong path with barriers. You can't go over this. You won't make it if you go over it. So then you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Now think about it. For people listening, they're going, I would never buy that. Sure, because you're listening to me, Tori, telling you the truth about it. But when you're surrounded by people, imagine being in your room, whoever you are, and there's two or 300 people going, yeah, that's right. Well, okay, all these people look pretty happy. They're doing great. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm on. I'm in. And you can't share any doubts. You have. I mean, we're. You know, there's something called a knowledge report where you kind of rat on each other. Were you ever written up, or did you ever write anyone up? Always, always. <laughs> if I'm a rebel. But, but you know, again, people listening to this will hear that and go, "I would never be in a group where that happened." And you have to remember, you have been exposed to things that we were never exposed to. There was no internet when I got in in 1969, but most of your listeners were not even born. They weren't even a concept when I got in Scientology. Do you know what I mean? There was absolutely no internet really until 2000, maybe 2005 or 10, that where where people had a lot of access to it in Scientology. So we had nothing. You know, the only thing you could do, because there were people that had left in the 50s and were out talking about it. But if you went to talk to them, go ahead. You want to talk to them? Go right ahead. But you will never get back in these doors. So you make the decision. It's like, go talk to those people, but you're never going to come back in these doors. I mean, these are powerful, powerful tools. And I mean, you know, I sat through a lot of the Nexium trial. I don't know what you know about the Nexium cult, but Keith Ranieri stole a ton of stuff from Hubbard. And that continued on in Nexium with the internet. I think it's really <laughs> kind of arrogance to say that that wouldn't work on me. Maybe not that cult, maybe not Scientology, but these tools are, you know, they're powerful. No, um, they are. I only say it because I have spent 20 years trying to help people. And most people at first, when I say a few things I've said on here, will say, I would never do that. That's their first absolutely. response. I would never yeah. do that. So I mention it over and over because... Of course you wouldn't, but mm-hmm. you're listening to the full picture. Right. If you were in the Truman Show, just like Truman was, and if you haven't watched it, watch it, because that's how Scientology works. You're surrounded by people in the show. I escaped out in 2000. Mm-hmm. I started having parties because I lost my husband and all of my friends overnight. That was it. You're out, you're done. Nobody will even talk to you at all, Right. Mm -hmm. So I started having parties and these people would come in and it was just amazing. And it is to this day, we all get together and it's like, okay, I was in this room. You were in that room. What happened in your room? Oh, really? What happened? This is what happened in my room. Well, wait a minute. Get her. She was over in that other room. You know what I mean? It's like Scientologists, you know, is that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. We're still connecting the dots and this has gone on for 20 years. Wow. It's like totalitarianism, that's how it works. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing at all, ever. Can I tell you the rest of OT3 just so you... Oh, yeah, go ahead, yes. 
I do OT3. I think I'm, you know, totally erased epilepsy. I go home and I think I don't really need to take this medicine anymore. I've erased epilepsy. And within a week, I start having, and many people may not know this term, but it's called status epileptic. And it's numerous grand mal seizures in a row. And I start having them. And I knew this one guy, Jerry Hall, who was kind of on the fence. He wasn't really in Scientology, wasn't really out. But I knew Jerry would get me to Morton Plant Hospital, which was right down the block. I knew if I called the Church of Scientology, they would do later what they did to Lisa McPherson, which was drive her 45 minutes to a Scientology doctor, and she died on the way. Right. So I called Jerry, and I don't even know what I said. I just said, get over here. He came. He got me to Morton Plant Hospital. The doctors told me, five more minutes and you would have been dead. And I'm listening to the story, and I'm wondering, did you ever say to yourself, well, the reason I'm having these seizures is the thetans that are stuck on me coming off or sort of? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Right. Okay. And so do they. You know, it's like, right. I said, well, I finished OT3. I know, but you haven't done OT5 or OT7, and those will help you. It's always like a fish, you know, in front of you with, you're almost there to catch it, but not quite. Right. And you said you stayed because of hope. So what were you hoping would happen? Remember, my original goal was I wanted to be a doctor. That wasn't going to work. So, okay, I'll be an auditor, which is like a counselor. I thought, perfect. I can be a counselor. I can make money. I can do what I want. I wanted to help people. That was it. That's why I joined Scientology. And that's why a lot of people join Scientology, because they think I want to help people. They know that's a big button, so they push it all the time. So I ended up in 72 joining the Sea Organization, which is Hubbard's little group of people out on the ocean for years, which he was out on the ocean to stay away from the IRS. Right. (laughs) But they were young kids and they were his crew, right? So I joined the Sea Org and within a few, I think a month or two, I ran out of my medicine for epilepsy. And so I said, look, I'm out of my medicine. I've got to get medicine. And they sent me to what they call the MLO, which that's another thing with cults. They have all these terms so that you're always kind of on the outside trying to get on the inside. So you're always trying to learn and keep up with all these terms. So what's an MLO? It's the Medical Liaison Officer. Sounds pretty impressive. It was an 18-year-old kid, (laughs) totally not trained in medicine at all. Uh And he said to me, Tori, we don't take medication. We're the top 10% of the planet. So we're going to get you off your medication with Dianetics and vitamins. And here's the reference for vitamins. And he showed me this thing with Adele Davis. If you took enough magnesium, that would handle seizures. I was like, oh, okay. Long story short, I start having grand mal seizure after grand mal seizure after grand mal seizure. And thankfully, my mother stayed on top of it. And she called me every day. And I was having these grand mal seizures, so of course I was losing my short-term memory. So now she said, what are you doing tonight? And I said, I'm going out on a date. She said, okay, I'll call you tomorrow. So she called me the next day. She said, how was your date? And I said, what date? And she said, Tori, listen to me carefully. Either you are on your medication today and your doctor calls me today and tells me you are on your medication or I I am personally going to fly out from Chicago to L.A. I will be there by tomorrow. And believe me on this, Tori, L. Ron Hubbard and the Church of Scientology will never forget your mother. And I knew my dad by then was working for NBC, broadcasting with Kurt Gowdy. And I knew they had all these lines to different media. And I knew my mom. She was a kick-ass woman. And she would have not just come and nailed Hubbard and the church. She would have been on every media station saying, don't let your kids get in Scientology. So they gave me my medicine and I took it for 30 years, but I fought them for 30 years about it. They always were trying to get me off of it. I mean, up until when you left, were they still? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's why I always say people when I left were like, they would call me and say, we're really worried you're going to go back. And I'd say, okay, listen to me carefully. You saying that to me, Tori, having gone through this shit with my medicine is like telling a Jewish person they're going to go back in the concentration camp. It is not going to happen. That's so interesting because I, I told uh, my boyfriend that I was doing this interview and he said, the question I want to know is, did she ever want to go back? 
Never. <laughs> That's the, Not ever. <laughs> That's the question. As much as a Jewish person would want to go in a concentration camp, <laughs> okay. you can tell them that. I will. <laughs> so you said you were part of some, a secret mafia. What was the aim and what was your part of it? What happened is the internet came around in 2000, around there, you know, early 2000s, where people, the average public person, had access to the internet. And my auditor and best friend, Bill Yachty, said to me, because he knew I wasn't going to do it if the Office of Special Affairs, which was, they originally had the Guardian's Office, which were people who they said were PR and legal, but the truth is they're PR and legal and they do the dirty trick on the ex-Scientologists or even, you know, journalists, all kinds of things. They do shit. Eleven people went to prison, including Mary Sue Hubbard in the 70s, or I think it was the 70s. It might have been the 80s. I think it was the 80s, the early 80s when they had the, the bust of the Guardian's office and they all these guys went to prison for a year. And of course, Hubbard goes, I didn't write those programs. She did. Totally throws his wife <laughs> under the course. bus. <laughs> and she, right, and she went to prison, right? Yeah, you're right. She went yeah. to prison. Yeah. She got none of the money of the Hubbard family, and she never was allowed to speak again, really, ever. They had guards on her. We would run into her at a movie theater. Hey, Mary Sue, how you doing? And she'd be like, fine. And she'd talk to my husband for a while because he knew her from 1950. But you know, he was born in the cult because his parents were in the cult, my ex-husband. So Yachty says to me, these evil people are on the Internet. You need to help us. I mean, I think you're the only person that can really do this story because they don't allow walk-ins. Talking about people that set up emails. And he said, they only do it online. But I think you, knowing you, you can push your way in, pay for it with a check a cashier's check, and get us an email and a password. That's all I want you to do. He goes, here's the address. I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. I go down there. I push my way in. I give him some story. And see, Scientology, they're basically liars all the time. Like I asked my friend, how do you know when they're lying? And she said, if their lips are moving, <laughs> you know, because they're, they're lying all the time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, just by the nature of being a Scientologist, it's a lie because you think you're helping mankind, you're not. Mm -hmm. And the proof is in they can't talk to me or anybody else. If they were could follow any of their technology, they would be able to say, well, we can't talk to anybody. We can't read books that are against it. We can't watch Leah Remini's show. We can't look at the Internet. You know, those are proof that they are not free. Okay, right. They can say they're free, and you can you know dance around and say you're free. But if you can't do those things, you're not free. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Yachty says to me, these evil people are on the Internet. We've got to handle it. You go open the account. I open it. I get the email. I get a password. I bring it back. And he has a grin like as big as California. I've never seen him with a bigger grin. This is like the middle of 2000, I think. And he says, you've just changed the history of the Internet. And I say, Bill, how can I change the history of the Internet when I don't even know what it is? And he goes, well, you just did. And now they hire me and start flying me around to different cities to open up these phony accounts. And what he did was he opened up 10 different identities and he would get on the Internet as Mike Smith or different people. And one was a very technical person who knew the Scientology technical. One was a real victimy person who was like really having a hard time and needed help. One was very witty and smart and funny. You know, he had all these different identities, and he could keep track of them. So he would go on the Internet as these different people. I don't know if anybody knows it or not, but back then, the only real thing talking about Scientology, except for Xenu.net, which is my friend in Norway, who was never in Scientology, but put up a huge website about it. Besides Xenu.net, there wasn't anything except this news group called Alt-Religion Scientology, which you can still do the Wayback Machine and look at. And Alt-Religion Scientology was just topic after topic after topic, literally, just one after another. That was it. There was no chatting or going into a private room or anything like that. It was just topic. People could comment on it. Topic. People could comment on it. So their view was if anything hot got posted, like L. Ron Hubbard is a liar. Okay, get it off the first page, onto the second. 
because very few people read the second page, which is actually pretty true. Mm -hmm. So their thing was to just spam ARS down. They, They didn't tell me this, and if I knew this, I wouldn't have done it. But I didn't. So they just said, we're going to handle it. Don't look at it. And I said, well, what are you doing with these accounts? And he said, look, these are really evil people. They're going to get you in deposition for months. And you don't want that, Tori. So we're just not going to tell you. And then you can honestly say, I don't know. I don't know what they were doing. And he said, doesn't that sound better? And I said, yeah, okay, because I really trusted him. I had told him, I'll do anything. Whatever you ask me to do, I will do it, Bill. So they knew, okay, she's our girl. She'll do it because I'd already said it in session. It wasn't that same website or news group um, kind of the beginning of you leaving Scientology? Yeah, and I wouldn't read it because I was really afraid of the Internet because one of my dear friends, Nancy Maney, had literally pretty much gone insane. It looked like she was jumping out of her back window of her house and really screwed up. It took me leaving to talk to her and find out Bill said, oh, she went insane because she was reading the Internet, Tori. That's why you don't want to read it. I was like, oh, okay. I'm never reading the Internet. But when I got out, I found out they had drugged her and reverse audited her. Auditing makes you better. Reverse auditing makes you worse. Most people have never even heard the term reverse auditing in Scientology. You don't even know what it is. No. But they do it. Wow. And so... I didn't want to read the internet, so I wasn't looking at it. But what happened is, do you, do you remember Battlefield Earth? Yes. Who could forget it? Okay, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was like one of the worst movies ever, even for we in Scientology. It was like, oh, my God, what a nightmare. No, this is awful. So, okay, they started a message board called Battlefield Earth, and my friend Mark Bunker, who's now a dear friend of mine, but at the time he, he had Xenu TV. And you have to know, back then, the word XENU, Xenu, was highly confidential. No one knew it. They didn't want anyone to ever see it. So I started fighting them on this message board just to try to get rid of the word Xenu. I started calling him the fat TV guy and stuff like that. Of course, he didn't change it. They were laughing their asses off, watching me go nuts. (laughs) And so I finally called Warner Brothers, and I said, look, You've got up this message board about Battlefield Earth. I'm a mom. I'm a fan. I live here in Burbank. And this is ridiculous. You've got all this stuff about the Church of Scientology on your message board about Battlefield Earth. Take it down. Now, I'm in sales, and I know how to get up to the top person. And I did. And he said, okay, I will report it. And he did. And the next day, a guy from New York called me. This is Mr. So-and-so from Time Warner, New York, and we got your message, and we are taking down the message board Battlefield Earth. Wow. I was like, wow, okay, cool. But I really missed those guys. They were like cowboys in the old days. They could say what they wanted. They could do what they wanted. They didn't have all these restrictions that we had as Scientologists. And I just thought, oh, I just missed that. I mean, it was like real freedom. And I thought, well, now I've gotten rid of it. Now I can't even talk to him, even though I was sort of pretending talking to him. I wasn't like really talking to him. So I thought, I know, I'll go on alt-religion Scientology. And I did. Now, they had already put the net nanny on the Internet, on all of our computers. So what really happens is that blocks out everything negative about Scientology. Everything. You know, oh, people hate Scientology. Where? I don't see it. No. But that was back in, in, I think, 1999, I think we did that, or 98. Mm-hmm. So, so Yachty had come to my house and said, I have to take something off your computer, and then I want you to do something. So I said, I just bought this computer. What did you have to take off? And he explained that, you know, well, this is a thing that would hurt your case. We don't want that to happen to you, so I'm going to take this thing off. So he took off the net nanny. So now I have access to the Internet, and that's how I was able to see still too afraid to read, and he knew that, and he said, don't read anything. I just want you to look around, and if people are asking for the OT5 material, you get me their name. That's all. And I said, okay. So that's all I did. That was it. And then I started making little posts that you can still go back in the Wayback Machine, and I think I was Miss Magoo 55 at the time. They're just nuts. 
I just sound like an insane person. And people were saying that. They were saying, she's crazy. Don't, don't even talk to her. Or they thought I was a guy. So they were saying, don't talk to him. He's, he's just nuts. You know, he's crazy. I was online from early in the morning until 2 in the morning. Wow. No, 4 in the morning. I was on until 4 in the morning. Then I would go to bed because I'm kind of a night owl. And so these people would say, no, wait a minute. Oh, this has got to be the Sea Org. No, it's not the Sea Org. It's got to be the gold people out, you know, where it's a whole big staff. They're running this Miss Magoo 55. Mm -hmm. No, it's David Miscavige because it's all day, (laughs) all night, right? And then they were like, no, because I went to bed at four, right? Which is six, four, five, six, seven in Florida. Mm -hmm. They said, no, it's the flag land base. That's how they're making all these posts. They have all the staff at Flag are posting on alt religion Scientology. You know, they're posting all these crazy posts. Wow. So, and it was really uh, just me in my dining room. But this was also a big part of your waking up, right? How did that happen? Well, the, the big part of my waking up was, number one, OT7 didn't work. I was on okay. it for seven years. It didn't work. They wouldn't let me off. I was 100 pounds overweight. And Hubbard said, you can't get better if you're trying to audit over a present time problem. And that was a huge problem for me. And I kept trying to write up to Miscavige, number one, I am auditing over a present time problem. I have to get off and lose this weight. All I would get back, okay, continue. Then I would write, look, this level doesn't work. Everyone's having problems with it. We're not having gains on it. Uh Okay, continue. You know, just on and on and on. So finally... In 97, I just went, that's it. I'm done. I'm done with this, not just for this lifetime, but lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. I will never do this again. So I'd already quit auditing, but I was still in the group, and I didn't want to lose all my friends and my husband. Okay. So there you go on that. So finally, back then in the news group, it would have you would say something. In between, it would be all these arrows, and then I would say something. Mm -hmm. Now, I only knew how to copy paste. That was it. So I would make some kind of stupid post like Phil Scott needs slippers because he's going to Hawaii. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just doing anything to keep people off of reading about L. Ron Hubbard's a liar or, you know, any of their facts that were awful things. And again, I wasn't even reading those. Do You see what I mean? I was just posting junk just to spam ARS. Right. At the time. Mm -hmm. And really, for me, it wasn't the Office of Special Affairs running me, which people think that wasn't. I'd already, you know, I was like, I don't like these guys. I don't want to work for them. I'm not really doing this. And so it was just me doing it. I had already had this thing where I sort of realized they're stopping free speech. Because one day, what happened was I grew up in Chicago around the mafia. And so I knew how they acted. And Bill had told me, don't call me Bill on the phone call me Jack, and I'm not going to call you Tori, you're going to be Katie. You know, so they were getting really mafia-like, and I thought, I hated Miscavige, and I thought, you know what, it's not impossible that David Miscavige would hire a mafia guy to kill one of these big critics. And I thought, I better go look on the internet and see what's happening. And the day I looked, they had a thousand recipes on how to bake cupcakes, stuff like that. Right. And I thought, no, this is stopping free speech. So I called Bill and I said, I really can't do this anymore. I have to go back to work. And he said, okay, great. We'll just meet you at this apartment. We just want to debrief with you. And I went over there. It was all men, dark, all guys I knew who used to give me hugs. They're all like, hello. They're really ticked off at me. And I thought, okay, something's weird. And Bill wasn't there. And all of a sudden, the door slams open, and it's Gavino, the guy running it, who was in the Sea Org, and Bill. And Gavino says to Bill, I warned you about her. And I say, you warned me about what? Why didn't you tell me? Anyway, two hours later, they're yelling at me, they're screaming at me, and I just run out. I burst out crying, and I run out. Bill realizes he screws up, and I'm like, that's it. Get away from me. Stay away from me. So that was really when I left Scientology, that night, because they turned on me. But then I got on to ARS, started making these posts. Finally, Andreas writes me and he says, Magoo, nobody can understand what you're saying because you're not formatting 
what you're doing. And I said, I don't know what formatting is. And you have to realize now I'm talking to the biggest suppressive person on the planet, I think, because he has this huge website up, zenu.net. And I think, whoa, this is so intense, but he's trying to help me. Okay, so he goes, all right, here's what you do to format one, two, and three. I do it. It works. And I think, oh, my God, this is like the worst person on the planet, but he just helped me more than Scientology ever has. So my mom always taught me, write a thank you note. And there's a little blue link there, which was his email. So I clicked on it and put, dear Andreas, thank you for helping me, Magoo. And so he writes back, you're very welcome. Best wishes, Andreas Heldelin. But he has his full address, full phone number, cell phone number on it, all that. And I think, oh, my God, here he is, the biggest suppressive on the planet. We're lying about where we are, who we are what we are, our phone number, our addresses, everything. It's all lies. He's out there telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And that was a major change for me. And I wrote him and said, I said, you know, thank you so much. And he said, well, you're welcome. I said, I just have to ask you one question. Like, why are you attacking my religion? And he said, Tori, I believe in truth. I believe in looking at both sides. And I have the courage to say what I think. I don't think Scientologists are bad. I just think they're misinformed. I suggest you start reading. And I always wanted to go back in the Sea Org, so I found Mary Tabioyan, who's now passed away, but I found her article. Ladies, if you're thinking of joining the Sea Org, read this. And I read it, and it turns out now they have enforced abortions. No one is allowed to have children in the Sea Organization in Scientology. And I sat and cried for four hours. I couldn't stop crying because it was just awful. It was like how she had, they made her get an abortion and then they made her go back on post the next day. And it just was like so awful. And I was just like, I did not join Scientology to stop free speech. And I did not join Scientology where they won't allow children. This is awful. You know, and, and I wrote to Andreas and I said, I don't know what to do. I can't talk to anyone. I can't talk to my husband. I can't talk to my friends. I, I can't stop crying. Help me. And he said, I'm crying reading your email. I'm sorry you're going through this, but I have to ask you this one question. What kind of friends could those be if they're going to leave you because you changed your mind? And that was it. It was like the Truman Show blew open. And that was it. I was free. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing story. You know, your husband stayed in and divorced you after you left. I mean... You took a big risk. You you left everything you knew. You lost all your friends. I mean, do you think there was something about your personality or your upbringing that allowed you to do that? I think it's a combination of being raised a Catholic. So I, I was in touch with God always. I never really disconnected from him, whereas my ex-husband had zero higher powers. Mm -hmm. He wasn't raised in any other religion. He was raised a Scientologist. And my parents, I do think my parents... My father had a great deal of courage. They both were free speech advocates, and they believed in truth. And they did believe in looking at both sides. Everything Andrea said, I thought, that's me. That's what I got into Scientology to do. And here I am at the top, and I can't do any of it. It was just awful. It was so awful. And I was like, Andreas, you have to help me somehow. So he had Stacy Brooks, who was in Clearwater, Florida, send me an email. And she said, Dear Magoo, who are you? Stacy Brooks. And she was a top executive in Scientology at the time. And they had left. She'd escaped out. And so I said, Stacy, remember when you left, you know, you were really scared and that, 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 because you don't know who you can trust. And I said, I, I can't really tell you. So then I get an email back and I think, oh my God, she wrote me back, Stacy Brooks. And I click and open and it says, Dear Magoo, sorry, we can't help you, Stacy Brooks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I felt like I was on the ledge of a mountain nude a thousand feet up. And there's a little sign at the bottom that says you might make it if you jump. And I had to jump. I had to make the leap. And I said, okay, I'm Tori Bazazian. That was my married name. You know, I'm OT7. I'm this and that. And she called me up. She goes, I know you. We used to audit together. You know, it was just, it was really great. One of the things you say is that Scientologists, and this I resonate with so much, is they don't know how creepy they are. 
So whether it's the Squirrel Busters or the Tom Cruise tape, right? If you're in Scientology and you're looking at the Tom Cruise tape, what are you seeing that the public who's out of Scientology isn't seeing? It's a member of the Truman Show. You know, he's so off the rails. It's like a train off the tracks, but everyone's telling him, you're not off the tracks. You're right on the money, man. This is perfect. This will really get them. But you have to realize they can't talk to anybody else outside the show. So everybody in the show is saying, yeah, great job. And everybody outside the show is laughing at it. Most of the people that were in Scientology when I was in are out. Most of us. The vast majority. We're always like, why are the five friends that we still have still in? Mm -hmm. What is it about them that they're not waking up. You know, they have access to the entire internet. You know, remember, we had to go over to someone's house back in the day. Mm -hmm. And they said, if if you go into their house and walk in that door and we get a knowledge report that you were in there, you're done. Right. So you think those are very rigid people or true believers or? um... I was a true believer. Spanky Taylor, who's in Going Clear, is one of my dear friends, said, Tori, honestly, I thought you'd be turning out the lights. I thought you'd be the last person <laughs> last to person to go. Right. <laughs> so, you know, yes, I think they're true believers. I think some are making money in Scientology. It's so it works. Do you see what I mean? Because that's what they do. Many of them have been in there so long, they just can't even imagine what would I do if I left. They don't know that thousands of us are out here. They don't know that. Right before I left, I got with my best friend, and both of us knew thousands of Scientologists. And we admitted to each other we only knew four people anymore that were in Scientology. That's it. Mm. And we were like, well, where did everybody go? Well, a lot of them died. Some committed suicide. I know 15 kids who've committed suicide, myself personally. But back then I knew four. But even still, it's too many. It's too four many. too many. My yeah. son's best friend killed himself. But, um, you know, some are off helping their families because their parents have gotten older and the rest moved to Clearwater. <laughs> so, what, so what happens when you're in Scientology and say, you know, Joe Blow friend that you see all the time and all of a sudden he's not there? Do they have a story about where he went or is he just gone and nobody well, knows? Some are declared suppressive, right? Uh-huh. Like I'm declared suppressive, meaning no one's allowed to talk to me. So mm-hmm. that's why you wouldn't see me around. I go around all the time because I refuse to, you know, go along with that. And I want people to have somebody to talk to if they want to leave. Mm-hmm. So I'm mm-hmm. always milling around Scientology and They're always trying to get people in, and I just stand outside the testing center and say, there is nothing free in Scientology, nothing. And because they're like, oh, it's a free movie. I said, there's nothing free. (laughs) And most of them just hand them their tickets and walk on. If they go in, they come out with a book, and I say, didn't I tell you there's nothing free in Scientology? Believe me, this only gets worse. And you can return it if you want. And some of them return it, some of them keep it. It's amazing that they have still have people going in it at this point. I mean, we have I know. Leah Remini's show. I mean, every yeah. week she's doing, you know, or was doing, uh, exposing uh, the abuses of the Church of Scientology. Right. So why is it still allowed to exist? That's a good question. We, we live in the United States of America. This country was founded the freedom of religion. That's what it started with. Mm-hmm. And free speech. So... Scientology, they they have the title of religion, even though I and many others say they're the farthest thing you can think of of a religion. Mm -hmm. But they have the title of religion. And as that, you know, there's a lot of things that the government can't do because they're a religion. I mean, they can lock people up in a hole, which they did for years until enough of us reported it. They now stopped doing it. But they had it out in Hebben, California, locked in a hole day and night, locked in. We were like, how could this happen? Why wouldn't the FBI get on this? Right. You know, or CIA or somebody, you know, go in this and check it out. No, because they're a religion. That's their religious belief. They believe they should be locked in those things. That's it. There's nothing we can do. You just wonder with things like Waco and, you know, 
you know, yeah. Scientology has never, that we know of, gotten a bunch of guns and gotten some kind of arm. Oh, yes, form. they do have oh, they guns. Do? They oh, they do? They do have guns. Okay. This is a good question because many, many journalists ask me, would they ever do a Jonestown thing? Now, mon- some of your listeners may not even know what that is, but you can Google it. And yeah. it was a cult, and they all killed themselves per the cult leader's instruction. So journalists would ask me, would Scientology ever do that? And I'd say, oh, no, never. Because remember, I was mostly a public because they routed me out of the sea or because of my need for med- medicine. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm saying no for years. Now I meet Mark Headley, who wrote the book Blown for Good, which is a great book if you want a book about Scientology at the top, you know, kind of what goes on. So he writes a book. Another person I want to mention is Jesse Prince, who wrote The Expert Witness, A Life at the Top of Scientology, because he helped run Scientology and escaped out in the early, early days. And that's another great book, because it really, really goes into things. But anyway... How do they have armed guards? Thank you. Or or, or how do they they arm themselves? Oh, yeah. Would they ever do Jonestown? And I'm like, no way, no way. I asked Mark Headley, okay, now you're out. And he was way at the top also. Would they ever do Jonestown? And he goes, 100%. If David Miscavige ordered it, 100%, it would happen. Mm -hmm. And I look at his wife, Claire Headley, and I say, Claire? She was higher up than he was. She was in RTC, which is the Religious Technology Center, who helps run all of the organizations of Scientology. And I said, really? That you think they would do a Jonestown? And she goes, 100% if it was ordered. And they have guns all over, buried in, out at gold in Hemet, California. Oh, that's so they have the guns, and yeah, they would. A very few people are even aware of the connection between uh, Farrakhan and the, um, right. it's not the Church of Islam, it's the, um, the Nation, of, nation Islam. of Islam. Thank you. The Nation right. of Islam and the connection. So what is the connection and why did you speak out about it? First of all, I knew they only had, all the time I was in Scientology, which was 30 years, there were only really like five black people in Scientology. And I would always say, Why don't we have more, you know, African-Americans here? Why don't you get more people in? Now I get out. I hear Louis Farrakhan say, it's posted on the Internet at the time, and I had gotten rumor that he had joined Scientology. I thought, no way. Now I hear him, and he says to his group, either you are on course on Tuesday night or we're going to thank you and say goodbye. Now Scientology has a thing called disconnection where they declare you suppressive like me, And everyone has to disconnect from you. Now, they try to say, oh, no, no one told us to do that. We just don't like Tori anymore. The proof of how that's false is because everyone who leaves connects up with the people that they disconnected from. So, no, it isn't that they, they really wanted to disconnect from you. But I'm very against disconnection. And I look at Louis Farrakhan and I realize he's ordering these people to basically disconnect. You know, either you're on course or we're going to disconnect from you. So I turn on my webcam and I make a a thing, a message to the African-American community. And I tell them, look, this is Scientology, because he never said Scientology, he never said Hubbard, nothing. They just had to be on course. So I said, look, this is what he's talking about. And here's what's going down. And they really don't care about you. They care about bodies in the shop, your money, and any connections. That's all they care about. It doesn't matter what they say. That's what they care about. I made that video. And a lady, I think a year later, said, do you realize that your your video went viral in the, the black community? And I said, no. And she said, it did. And I said, why? And she said, because you're the only person who told us what was going down. Right. And that Sunday, I would made it Tuesday night. That Sunday, my friend called me. She goes, turn on the TV. You're not going to believe it. And I turned it on. It was Crow TV. And this other black man was talking. And he said, Louis Farrakhan has flipped out. And he's ordering people from the Nation of Islam to join Scientology. And it's not right. And we're going to have an expert on. And she's going to tell us about it. And they played my little video. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. You know, and, and also the, the Nation of Islam doesn't get much press. And uh, very yeah. few people uh, know about know about even that there's a connection between the two. Um, yeah, he's actually gone clear. 
Because, see, originally I, I saw some videos of the Nation of Islam, you know, these big, tough guys, and they were around the Scientology org, and I thought, okay, what's the deal? And the guy said, somebody said, you're a Scientologist, and he said, no, no, we're not Scientologists, we're Dianeticists. And I thought, oh, okay, that's where they're getting it, because they have body problems, and they're saying Dianetics will fix it, right? Mm-hmm. And that's all there is to it. It's not part of the religion, it's just Dianetics. But now Louis Farrakhan has gone clear. Now, after clear, now you're in Scientology. You know, you're a Scientologist at this point. So I don't know what's happening. I mean, he's obviously turned into a giant hypocrite, you know, just by the nature of he's saying he's in the nation of Islam and he's a Scientologist. doesn't work. Right. No. The big lie, I guess, is what I heard, you know, growing up in the 80s is, oh, you can keep your own religion and still be a right. Scientologist. Right. They always say that. They always say that. I did, too. Oh, yeah, I was raised a Catholic, and I'm a Scientologist. Ask me how many times I went to Mass. It doesn't matter. They'll still lie. Mm-hmm. You know, if they realize well, that's what we need to say, they'll lie and say, oh, I go every week to Mass. Really? Okay, let's go. <laughs> As I'm listening to this, I guess I'm overcome with the irony that you got into Scientology to help people, and I guess you've helped a lot of people, probably more than you've imagined, just by I leaving helped. Scientology yeah, and talking I- about it. Yeah, I helped no one while I was in. That's what was the irony, is that I really helped no one. And I, and I used to always feel that way. I'd feel like, well, I'm almost there to help people, but not really. But now that I'm out, I have just helped tons and tons of people. It's been really amazing. It's been wonderful. So do you have a fatalistic feeling about it, like this was your fate to join Scientology in some way? I don't think so. I remember in 2000, I said to God, okay, I'm giving my life up to you. You can take it, do whatever you want for a year. That's it. I was at a Scientology New Year's event. My husband was outside handling the critics, quote unquote, and I was inside. And I just kind of beamed up to whatever I thought was God, said, okay, take my life for a year. And I thought I'd be clearing Brazil or something like that. But instead, I ended up on the Internet and that whole top secret mafia project. And that's what helped me wake up, you know, because I really got to see the darker side of Scientology, which most people never see. See, the people that are still in, they don't see that. My husband never knew about it. I couldn't talk to him about it. If I said a word, I had to pay $100,000. How does it work that you have to pay $100,000? Do you mean? I had to sign a thing. Oh, wow. If I tell anybody, I'll pay $100,000. So I'm like, okay, I won't tell anybody. Sure. But, you know, then when you leave, your friends are like, what happened? And it's like, "Uh, it's a little hard to catch up on this. I've been doing it for, you know, 10 years. (laughs) Right. What's the future, I mean, uh, of Scientology? I mean, besides buying buildings, where can they go from here now? I think it's a downhill slide. I mean, I really do. I don't think, I mean, they can get more buildings. You know, like I told them when I first left, if you got rid of all the negative things that they do, which are awful, you know, stopping free speech, declaring people suppressive, you know, fair game where they, Hubbard said you can lie, cheat, steal, destroy someone utterly and without any consequences, right? And so they've done a lot of creepy stuff to me and to many of my friends, right? Mm -hmm. But if they got rid of all that, and if you got rid of the OT levels, because they don't really work for 99.5% of the people, they don't work. And it's a ton of money. And if you lowered the prices and just did the lower bridge, which is like talk therapy and some little processes, but if you just did that, I think they'd be a very, very successful self-improvement group. And if they stop saying they're a religion. But they won't because that's their nonprofit status. Mm-hmm. Tori Chrisman, this has just been a really delightful interview. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And so anyone welcome. who hasn't visited Tori Magoo 44, the link will be in the uh, description of this episode. As you can see, I, I'm no lack of information. <laughs> I, I, we could keep probably keep going. There's so much to talk about. It's so it's such a fascinating topic, isn't it? The other thing I will say to anybody because they're probably thinking, well, what can we do? Well, number one, find out in your state because Scientology is trying to put their study tech in every public school in the United States. Right. So check around in your public schools because if you have Narconon, we had Narconon in every public school. We got it kicked out in California. 
I'm sure they're working through various states. So you find out at your school system, do they have Narconon? Do they have Way to Happiness? Do they have um, Applied Scholastics those or Scientology Study Tech? Because it's not that they're awful. I mean, Way to Happiness is basically the Ten Commandments. It's pretty similar to that. But what's bad about it is, A, it costs a ton of money for somebody, like some doctor they'll get with them, and that doctor has to shell out thousands to get those booklets out. B, it makes Hubbard look like he's a good guy, and he's not. So that's all they're trying to do is safe point L. Ron Hubbard. They have a thing called safe pointing L. Ron Hubbard. Oh, I can't ask you any more questions. <laughs> but I, Just for my own personal curiosity, is it just PR for the church? Uh, I hate to call it the church, but whatever, Scientology. Is it just PR for Scientology? Or is the idea to get young Scientologists, to get them early and get them interested? Well, the original thing for those was to safe point Scientology. Right. They already knew way back in the day people were against it. So it was to show, you know, these are little tools that work. But they're in many, many things that are free. You don't mm-hmm. have to pay Scientology. You don't have to be in a cult to get the same tools. Right. Make That's it. But it, yeah. it's that. And the young people, they are definitely after young people. Because young people, just like me, I was 22, you know, you're innocent. They say that you can do this and you go, oh, yeah, okay. Right. And it sounds good. I mean, I quit college. I know th- hundreds and hundreds of people who quit college to join Scientology. Don't do it. It's a bad idea. Very good advice. And there's so much more to talk about. I hope maybe you'll come back sometime and, and um, talk some more about sure. Scientology. Thank I you will. so much. Okay. You're welcome.